Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is officially March Madness. We can finally put away the snow shovels. We can break out our brackets. Thank you guys so much for taking some time with us here today as we break down our picks for this year's tournament and kind of the process of how we got there. Uh, I am Scott Halberstadt. I'm going to be our analytics cheerleader for today. Uh, whether it's sports or business, I just love getting under the hood on all this stuff. And I am joined today by uh, several members of our team. We've got uh, Dave Canabiran, Neil Canungo, they are data madness gurus. Adam Faskowitz is our basketball analytics aficionado. And we've got Bruce Borson, he's our resident bracketologist. So he will be walking us through uh, some of the storylines that we're gonna be looking at today. So we are here today uh, because the, the NCAA tournament really offers a unique challenge for us. 68 teams with the play-in games, it's a single elimination format. Building a perfect bracket really is nearly impossible. So the closest that anyone has ever come was back in 2019, when a gentleman from Ohio uh, was perfect through 49 games. So all the way through the Sweet 16. Uh, last year, thanks to some upsets, uh, the final remaining perfect brackets got busted on the 28th game. So overall, statistically, you have a 1 in 9.2 quintillion shot of picking every matchup correctly. So to help give you some context on how unlikely that is, you have a 1 in 220 chance of writing a New York Times bestseller. Uh, approximately 1 in 11,000 of you will be struck by lightning at some point. So good luck with that. Uh, you have a better chance of winning the Powerball than picking the perfect bracket. Statistically, you have a better chance of playing in the NBA. Uh, I, speaking only for myself, I'm vastly more likely to nail my bracket than get drafted by the NBA, and not just because I'm an old man, but uh, it's just sad. So one in 9.2 quintillion, that is six commas, folks. So the basketball experts among us can certainly narrow those odds, uh, but we all have our biases and we have our blind spots. So how can we improve all of our chances uh, in a really meaningful way? Well, we do that using the power of data science and predictive modeling. So right now we're using that power here to make better bracket decisions, but more importantly, we can use the same approach to make better business decisions as well. So let's take a look at how we use TIBCO technology to do that. So just like a great basketball team, we're going to start with fundamentals, right? So here that means a bedrock layer of data that's going to support absolutely everything else that we do. So we deploy data management and virtualization to bring together data from disparate systems, different formats, different sources. And we're going to create an abstraction layer so that we have consistent governed, trusted data for our analysis. Then we're going to go ahead and we're going to leverage visual analytics to explore and understand that mountain of data with AI augmentation layered throughout the platform. So everything from data wrangling to chart recommendations, that's going to support users of all types throughout the business to create ad hoc discovery as well as enterprise reporting. This includes uh, really powerful geocoding capabilities, which we're going to see in a little bit, as well as being able to leverage our predictive insights and all that made consumable by really best in class visualizations. So to that, let's now add data science and machine learning capabilities to that mix. So utilizing a suite of data prep, modeling tools, and templates, you can create features and confidently predict business outcomes. And with no code, low code, full uh, open source R and Python functionality, this is really going to empower both your dedicated data scientists as well as that new breed of citizen data scientists as well. Once those models have been developed, we can then operationalize those and put them into production wherever we need them. So whether it be on-prem, in the cloud, we can run them in real time or as scheduled executions. And then with those predictive insights, that can help us guide human-driven decision-making, or we can even incorporate that as part of our uh, process automation so that your business can really move really at the speed of data. And then finally, we're going to elevate all of that with the power of real-time streaming data. So the world, and really more specifically business, uh, has really never moved faster. So being able to collect, process, and analyze data in real time is going to give you that ability uh, to have that fast break advantage to capitalize on opportunities and mitigate risk. So with all of that as kind of our process and our background, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Dave, Neil, and Adam uh, so that they can walk you through how we approached this year's bracket. 
Thanks, Scott. Let me go ahead and uh, share my screen for a second here. Okay. So yes, yeah, so uh, so I can hop in here. So um, the first uh, kind of thing that we want to explore is a, a question that a, a lot of people um, kind of have, uh, whether they know a lot about basketball or not, is what's the relationship between uh, seeding and the amount of tournament wins. So um, what we noticed is uh, going back in our in our data sets to the early 2000s, uh, there was a pretty strong relationship, and we're looking at the correlation here between. Uh, the seed and the amount of wins. So uh, that was stronger kind of in the early 2000s, but we, what we witnessed in recent years, uh, kind of maybe starting around 2014, is that the R squared metric uh, kind of describing the goodness of fit of this correlation line uh, got a lot weaker. And, uh, and what that means is that uh, there might've been more underdogs and more lower seeded teams that, uh, have won more games and that kind of broke the relationship relationship between uh, the higher seeded teams uh, being the ones that go on to win. And uh, like a, a recent example of this was even just last year. Uh, it was a very hard year for a lot of bracketologists because uh, it was a lot of um, kind of lower seeds that made really um, big runs. So uh, yeah. like we think about UCLA and the play-in game, right? Absolutely. Hey, Adam, to piggyback on that. Yep. So last year, there was a 15 seed, a 12 seed and two 11 seeds in the Sweet 16, which obviously is not something that we're used to seeing. So it was a little bit of an outlier year in regards to that. But overall, last year, we did see a lot more parity than usual. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then that just goes to, you know, the slope being very, very, uh, you know, low and not very strong in that most recent year. And a lot of people are saying the same for this year that they're they intend that there could be a lot of parity and which makes it you know, more exciting for us as people who are gonna watch it. So, um, so this is kind of just our first uh, exploration, but uh, if we wanna move on to the next tab, uh, one of my favorite ways of trying to understand, understand trends over the years is through, uh, it's this animated bubble chart, uh, Spotfire mod actually. So this was an extension to Spotfire. Um, and if, yeah, if you wanna play this here, we can see how uh, the relationship of seed and tournament wins has actually evolved over time. So kind of what I was saying before, the left side of the screen is pretty strong um, in terms of the amount of tournament wins. But as you kind of go further more, you'll see that uh, it's really bouncing a lot on the right side, meaning that uh, the, the lower seeds uh, pretty randomly have had a varying amount of success. And it, so kind of the, the top three seeds you could say are pretty consistent at having a lot of wins but then from like four on it's pretty random on you know what seed and what teams end up being the ones that uh, actually perform really well at the end um and this is kind of just uh, our way of visually trying to explore this and then we can end them on last year's just showing that uh it wasn't you know any rhyme or reason from looking at maybe seed five to seed maybe 12 there so it's uh it's a very interesting um you know problem for us to navigate as people who try to predict this i agree i think the other thing that stood out to me especially with respect to seeds was looking at 2007 2008 just to kind of see how heavily it was skewed to the left meaning the top seeds did significantly well um and i think if i'm not mistaken 2008 is the only year in the history of the tournament when all four top seeds the number one seeds made it to the final four so that's very interesting um yeah, a lot that, of people yeah. probably expect more yeah exactly uh let me just jump in and, and add a few things about you know some of these different metrics that we have here so seeds an obvious one i think we all get that why seeds are important and how we would expect that to be a factor into the results of these matchups uh, but as you all know, there are a lot of different statistics out there that people leverage to kind of help, you know, pick, make their picks. So I'll just wanted to go through some of them without going into too much detail. Uh, but once you break it down, it actually makes a lot more sense. So let's take uh, adjusted offensive efficiency. So this comes from, you know, what uh, the Ken Pomeroy ratings, many of you are familiar with. So basically, offensive efficiency is an estimate of how much a team would score against 
what we would call an average division one defense, right? Against an average team, how much would any given team score? And the adjusted part is referring to adjusting for pace. As we all know, different teams have different types of pace and, you know, they play different styles. And so it's adjusting for that. So it's by a hundred possessions. So you're standardizing it by a hundred possessions. So that's how Ken Pomeroy does his adjusted offensive efficiency metric. So here you can see it actually has got a pretty good correlation with wins, meaning the higher your offensive efficiency for any given team, the higher the likelihood of going deep into the tournament, which at the outset makes a lot of sense. Uh, but if you actually look at defensive efficiency, we would have expected some serious correlation, positive correlation, but that's not necessarily the case. So that's interesting. And this kind of an animated bubble chart gives us the ability to very quickly, you know, break down the data in these different forums and look at it in ways we may not be able to do uh, when you look at it statically. Uh, also going through some of the other things that you're looking at here, the Jeff Sagarin ratings is something we've been using in the last couple of years, in addition to the Ken Pomeroy and Sunny Moore ratings. Uh, so this again, it's a cumulative rating. So we do expect significant correlation right? Because the higher ranked teams do, you know, we do expect them to go deep into the tournament. Uh, and there are other factors like win against top 25 teams, number of wins against top 50 teams, strength of schedule. Uh, draft run, uh, rating is a new one that we are trying to introduce this year. So the idea of draft rating is how many top draft prospects, NBA prospects, does any team have uh, for that particular year? And this is extremely hard to kind of, you know, uh, bring into the model because there are so many different factors. We've seen uh, Kentucky, for example, even though it, it has some of the top prospects every year, doesn't necessarily win at all. There are so many other factors that goes into it, which also is what makes college basketball fun. Uh, with that, let's dig a little deeper into the metric importance because anytime we start bringing in more and more data, the question then becomes, okay, where is that cutoff where we know that, hey, it's, it's actual value and signal that we're adding to the models rather than noise. So as you all know, we need to run different types of uh, variable selection and feature importance type um, analyses to identify what to actually use in our modeling. So what you're seeing here is a combination of primarily three main sets of data, right? One that comes from Ken Pomeroy, the other one comes from Jeff Sagarin ratings, and then there's the Sunny Moore rating. And then we have all these different ratings. We're running it through different types of feature selection methods to look at what are the important factors when it comes to helping predict uh, probability of win. Um, so this is what we were using about three years ago, I'm gonna say. But what we've done in the last few years is almost switch it. And rather than look at it as individual teams, we are now looking at it as matchups. So if you don't mind going to the next sheet, so here, what we have done is rather than look at the metrics of individual teams, we have tried to create these differentials. So we are almost making it into an arbitrary matchup of team A versus team B. And all we're interested in is the differential between all of these different metrics. So we have an adjusted team efficiency margin differential, and then there's a JS rating difference, right? So we have all of these differential variables that we have calculated. And when we run, these kinds of feature selection methods, you'll see the ones in gray are the team metrics and the ones in blue are what we're calling the matchup metrics. And those consistently come up at the top, which means that we're onto something here. So we've been kind of going in this new direction the last few years. Uh, and also what you're looking at, the four different is, these are just different ways of looking at which importance, uh, which variables are of importance. So there are univariate methods, multivariate methods, uh, iterative you know, methods. So we just try out different ways to kind of validate our understanding of the importance of these variables. And finally, before I hand it off to Bruce and Adam for the actual matchup, I just wanted to chime in here about the underlying workflow. So as, as Scott was saying, the real cool thing about what we're doing here is how you have the single pane of glass, which does everything, right? So everything from the data wrangling to the visual analytics, to the advanced analytics and embedded data science. So actually there's an underlying workflow. There's an actual data science model. As you can see, this booster tree, random forest, 
a neural network classification model that's all working behind the scenes. And we are then creating an ensemble out of it, but everything happens in a few milliseconds, right? So the end user just looks like clicking a button and all of this happens behind the scenes. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of throw that out there that there's a true advanced analytics workflow uh, that's turning behind the scenes in order to kind of do what we're doing next, which is uh, the matchup generator. Yeah, so here's the uh, matchup generator, and it's just taking in all those metrics that Dev was talking about, um, and that's taken into the model. What we're able to do is actually just select any two teams, and we're going to be going through this on a, a, a couple matchups for you. Uh, we can select any two teams, and it's executing that data science workflow behind the scenes to give us a, uh, um, a prediction of who's going to win. Um, and it's also running a REST API connection to, to see um, uh, the distance that's traveled. So this is something that's not included in our model, but it was a, a little extra flavor into our decision making, um, looking at like how far fan base is going to travel. Now, there are different matchup locations. We're not going to change this for every uh, individual matchup. Well, we only looked at this when uh, certain matchups were close. Uh, there is... Um, a few in particular where we could say, hey, the fans aren't going to have to travel too far for team A or team B. And uh, these are a 50-50 chance, so maybe we'll go with team A over team B in that situation. But without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll give it over to, to Bruce and Adam uh, to talk about some of the more interesting picks in our uh, bracket, uh, bracket construction. Perfect. Thank you very much, Neil. And to your point, what you'll see when we walk through a couple of these points is if there were, you know, sometimes we did go against the model just based on some additional context that we might have had outside of it in terms of just the location and or other factors. And so we will get into that. Um, but what I wanted to do is make sure we leave 10 to 15 minutes for questions at the end. So Adam, why don't we start with the East region if possible and take a look at Gonzaga and Georgia State. So for this matchup, Gonzaga is coming into the into the overall tournament as the number one seed outright, not in the region, just outright. So I wanted to call attention to this matchup between Gonzaga and Georgia State in the very first round. Um, Gonzaga is an 86, 87 percent favorite for the matchup, right? So uh, the reason I'm calling it out is actually uh, for the other one seeds. This was probably the the closest of all of the one versus 16s, which was strange due to Gonzaga's you know, overall talent across the board. And the reason that we think that is that this might be closer than expected, but Gonzaga's still going to pull it out is Georgia State has won 12 of 13 coming into the tournament. So obviously they're on a hot streak. Corey Allen from Georgia State is very elite, but at the same time, Gonzaga's elite across the board, including Chet Holmgren, um, and, and, and as well as a couple of the other nation's top players. And so this is one that we just want to keep an eye on. But overall, we do think Gonzaga's going to win this pretty handily. But we just thought it would be worth calling out that Georgia State might keep it a little closer than people are expecting. Um, Adam, can you switch to uh, Boise State versus Memphis, please? Great, thank you very much. So for Boise State Memphis, uh, Memphis has, this is one of those in the first rounds where it really can go either way with it due to the seeds. But what we saw from Memphis, just in terms of why they're such a favorite in this matchup is uh, a couple of different factors, right? So what we're looking at would be number one, they have a much better record uh, against uh, top 25. They just have more overall wins against top 25 teams. Um, they've got more star power on their roster. Um, they're actually three and one against top 25 teams this season. And then they went 10 and one to finish out the year. Thanks to what they saw as a significant increase in defensive efficiency. Um, so this one is, uh, and obviously Memphis has not been in the tournament since 2014. So we like that as, uh, as a rallying cry for them, but just overall Boise state likes to keep it close, but what you'll see is that they're going to turn the ball over a little too much. And top of that, they're going to have some bad free throw shooting, which in, in the tournament is always a, a killer. Um, and then Adam, could you pull up Bama and the undecided yeah. at this point? And I just want to call one, this one out. thing maybe to I'm sorry. Or, um, just well, just on the bottom screen. So so what you're looking at here too is you know the metrics that that we have in our model, right? So um, we have you know the Jeff Sagrin rating, the Sonny Moore rating, um, and 
I get so maybe we can finish. So what were the teams for for this one that we wanted to see? So, so this one was kind of a this one was Bama versus potentially uh, depending on who wins that playing game, it's going to be Rutgers or Notre Dame. Okay. okay, so who did we have winning that one? We have, we had, we have Alabama. Rutgers. Yeah, we have Alabama winning this one. We do think that Rutgers would give them more of a challenge should they be the competitor in that game. They've got six wins against top twenty-five teams, and Bama's lost three of their last four. But overall, they've got some of the most impressive wins on the year. On their resume, they have a win over Gonzaga. On their resume, they have a win over Houston. Um, typically, historically, six seeds have won 47% of the time since 2010 versus 67% of the time prior to that, right? And so uh, six seeds have had a little bit of a harder time here as of late. Um, but nonetheless, we do like Bama in this matchup. Yeah, and then so here we can really see from just the bottom margin. So one thing to think be to point out is that offensive efficiency, right? You know, it's something in March where if, if the teams make their shots, you know, those are the exciting games, but those are also the teams that are, you know, deadly to make a run and to come back in these games. So with such a strong kind of uh, that being that much better than Rutgers in that case, uh, that's certainly something. Then so Rutgers is a little bit more of a defensive team, which will be interesting to, to maybe see because they're actually ranked higher. That's where their um, strength might come from. So it's offense versus defense, but then kind of the rest of the ratings, as we see, these are things that went into the model. Um, you know, Alabama just has a strong edge. And then this new metric that we're looking at this year is that draft rating. So uh, we basically took the mock draft for 2022 and we took uh, kind of that, uh, superstar power and saying uh, when were they likely to be selected and let's give you know a certain amount of sway in our model towards that so we'll see that Alabama has some draft prospects but uh, Rutgers in this case does not so it kind of leans us in that one direction yeah and on top of that to Neil's point from earlier right we didn't necessarily have that dictating the model in terms of the location for the fan base travel but whether it be Notre Dame or Rutgers, uh, the Bama fans are just going to have a little bit of a shorter drive and or flight should they choose to go turn on their team. So just one more factor that we took into consideration. Okay, so uh, and then this would be the um, should we progress a, a couple more rounds, right? So what we're seeing play out in that region is a matchup between Duke and Texas Tech within the Sweet 16. So we do see Texas Tech winning a couple games, moving on, as do we have with Duke. Uh, we think Duke and Michigan State should be a pretty good game in that matchup, but then it brings us together with Duke and Texas Tech. And so this is going to be a great matchup, probably one of the better games to watch should it transpire that way. Um, the model does like Duke to ultimately keep Coach K's legacy alive uh, here in his last season. Uh, but overall, they just the, the 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 amount of NBA ready talent that Duke has is really just off the charts. You can see from the draft rating here. Um, you know, the, the, does that always dictate who wins? Most likely not, right? But um, what we are seeing is just when in these tighter matchups, sometimes that is the difference maker, right? So um, we think Texas Tech is going to have their hands full with Duke uh, overall. Um, got an elite defense and. Ultimately, went seven and four against top twenty-five teams. So um, yeah, it's an interesting one. It's another offense meets defense, right? I mean, it's like around the very top for offense versus the very top defense. Um, should be probably a really fun matchup to watch if it does come to that point. Right, and I, I, and anyone who's a basketball fan has seen the last couple of games from Duke, probably seeing that and raising an eyebrow. But overall, um, just on paper, Duke's going to be a very hard team to beat. So. We did want to call out this game as a potential matchup in the later rounds. Um, and then, Adam, if you could switch over to the East. And we want – actually, uh, I'm sorry, can you switch over to the Midwest? We're going to take a look at LSU and Iowa State. Let's go ahead and change the locations here, too. So where is LSU and Iowa State playing? Do we have that on our bracket? Yeah, so LSU and Iowa State are playing in Milwaukee, Wisconsin at Five Serve Forum. All right. So with this matchup, let me see what the actual numbers look like here. Because I think if I had a big alarm behind me, I'd be ringing it because this is an upset alert for the first round. Um, 
This is, I remember looking at this one thinking this is right in Iowa State's backyard right there in Milwaukee and uh, a little bit farther travel for LSU. It's a very close matchup, 51% uh, LSU wins, 52% LSU wins. You can see the defenses are, are pretty even, uh, evenly matched. They both beat three top 25 teams, um, a little more star power on the LSU side. Um, and uh, Sonny Moore and Jeff Sagarin reigns give, a, give a LSU a favorite as well. I believe we went with LSU on this one, right? All right, you know, we, no, we went to Iowa State on this one. Yeah, uh, so this with, one uh, well, with the fans. additional with, context, right? <laughs> yeah, the additional context with the fans. We actually went to Iowa State, right? Yeah, just with the with the closeness of the model, we went with some of the contextual conversations we were having. You know, distance for the fans to travel. Uh, outside of that, just LSU. Um, we wanted to look at some of the externalities, right? A little bit more of an inexperienced team. They struggle with turnovers. They struggle to shoot the three efficiently. Um, so all of those factors. And then while LSU might be a deeper team across the board, in my opinion, Isaiah Brockington on Iowa State is uh, probably the best person on the court whenever he's in the game. So um, overall, this is an early upset alert. We went against the model boldly, and we are choosing Iowa State for that first upset match. Um, Another one here in the Midwest that I want to call out would be USC versus Miami. And then this one's going to be played in Greenville, South Carolina. Give you a chance to get it. Yeah, so for this one, what we're seeing is... Miami is coming in around a 58, 59% favorite. They are on a hot streak. And so you're going to see and hear a lot about hot streaks to finish out the year. Um, there are some teams that really figured it out as the calendar started to turn, Miami being one of them, right? So they finished the season 18 and six. They have a trio of guards that can score. Um, biggest advantage for USC would be the rebounding, but they struggle a little bit on defense and at the free throw line. Again, going back to those two things being critical for success in March. Um, so for this one, we did end up going with Miami for the overall pick. And then there's a matchup in later rounds. Uh, let's see here. Last matchup in the later rounds, Adam, if you could go to Auburn and Wisconsin. So Auburn, Wisconsin would be a little bit later in the tournament. We foresee both of those teams doing well in the early rounds and ultimately coming head to head in the in Chicago. So uh, it's a toss up for this overall in terms of what the model is showing us. Um, Fifty four percent towards Auburn. Uh, what we decided was that Wisconsin is going to get the edge with a uh, game in Chicago. Uh, might help top 50 for uh, both offense and defensive efficiency. Auburn has Jamari Smith. Again, um, what you'll see is that's probably skewing, uh, at least the draft rating from, from them is coming from Jamari Smith. Um, they're an inexperienced team that turns the ball over. For that reason, we ended up going with the Wisconsin team. And then could you take us to the South, please? Specifically Seton Hall versus TCU. And I did notice there are some questions in the chat, so we'll try to get to those later. And then if there are any matchups that come to mind for your own bracket, please be sure to ask us later on just so that we can give you some transparency into what we decided with that pick. Yeah, feel free to enter some of your picks into the, uh, or some of your matchups into the, uh, the Q&A or the chat, and then we'll try to get to them at the end. So this one is 8-9 uh, matchup, Seton Hall versus TCU. Um, I think one reason we wanted to call this one out was just overall the, the percentage <laughs> that the, the model really likes uh, TCU for this matchup. Uh, reason why we think that might be just have them standing out so much. Um, really not a big upset, but TCU has more tw top 25 wins. Uh, Seton Hall constantly in foul trouble, struggle to consistently hit the three. Um, don't get me wrong, they've got the best player on the court, in my opinion, in Jared Roden. Um, but TCU is not only the best defensive team in this game, but one of the best defensive teams in the tournament. 
And so their defensive efficiency, the gap there is really what's driving that 72% probability to win. Um, and so sometimes the eight or nine matchups can be a toss up in that first round, not so much this time around, according to the model. So we do like TCU very heavily in this game. Um, and then could you pull up Colorado State and Michigan, please? By the way, this was very fun to put together and even more, even more enjoyable to kind of see it play out because this is uh, all very informative stuff, which is helping me. Yeah, we're learning what the model is, is saying and if it's confirming what, what we thought. I mean, that was, that was one of the biggest uh, probably upsets by the percent of uh, that the model thought that the, the team would potentially win by. I mean, it, it's not too risky given the seeds are pretty close, but. Um, it certainly said something that they went almost 75% in the opposite direction. Right. Absolutely. Um, so Colorado state, Michigan, uh, have Michigan coming in as the probable winner for this one. A couple of reasons that we are taking into account the game is being played in Indianapolis. So a little bit closer for both Michigan residents as well as Michigan transplants to, to attend the game. Um, more tw top 25 wins, but not only that, they had nine games against top competition. So they had nine games against the top 25 teams in the country. Colorado State had zero. So they didn't necessarily have a chance to win any big games, but they also weren't involved in many big games, at least in terms of talent. Um, the other thing we're calling out for this game, Juwan Howard is back from his suspension. I want to say that it was official on Wednesday. Will that be the rallying cry to drive Michigan through March Madness this year? Um, they're cold at the end of the year, but obviously they're a very talented squad. The only thing that stands out to me is that Michigan's lost to a few very mediocre teams. Um, UCF, Seton Hall, Minnesota, um, so they can be up and down. But we do think Jawan Howard coming back, being close to home, as well as Colorado State just being a little bit of a less inferior matchup. So we, we really like Michigan in that matchup. Uh, and then two that I want to call out in the South region, uh, Illinois versus Houston. So Illinois, I'll let you give you a chance to add on the pull that one up. Houston, the darlings from last year, the Cinderella team, right? Well, no one is, <laughs> is selling Houston short this year because they are uh, incredibly stacked on defense. They've So coming into this game, you've got Houston, who has experience from the Final Four last year, but they're, return, they're returning four senior starters from that team, right? And so overall, in terms of experience, been there, done that. Houston has the upper hand there. Uh, Illinois is a top 25 team in offensive efficiency, and then one of the best uh, teams on defense within the Big Ten. Um, furthermore, they might have the best player on the court with Kofi Cochran. Um, yet, the model is giving us what the model is giving us. And you can see that it is very heavily skewed towards Houston. And so this is one that it was a little bit of a surprise to all of us. Um, just, but then once you kind of start looking at the, the, the reasons why Houston's favored so much, it, it starts to make sense again, just that, uh, that overall adjusted defensive efficiency, offensive efficiency. Consistent, consistent across the board, right? That, right. that Houston's basically at the top. Um, but it, the, the thing that that's shocking, right? It's just the top 25 teams beat, but I think that just more to do with the scheduling, obviously, I mean, Illinois playing the, the big 10, they play a lot of good teams. So when you play a lot of good teams, you have more opportunities to, to win those games and Houston maybe hasn't gotten as many, but, um, in terms of just the ratings and, you know, what, you know, behind the scenes, what they're saying, uh, it's pretty, pretty clear that they're stacked across the board. So. Absolutely. And so you will see, we, we, we have a big 10 team making it pretty far within the tournament. Um, and so just my own personal feelings about the big 10 teams is, you know, usually they, uh, they, they, they burn out a little quickly before the, before the final game. But again, that was not necessarily calculated into the model. Um, and then another one. So Houston takes on Illinois, very heavily favored. They move on. Uh, Houston runs into Arizona because we have Houston going on a little bit of a run here. Uh, so Arizona, Houston within the same region. Uh, again, Houston's kind of their hands full, right? But Zona has been one of the most consistent teams in the country. So that's Arizona. Great on both sides of the ball. Um, let me see if it calls out the actually efficiency for that one. So it's just, a, they're just a very well-balanced team when it comes to both offense and defense. 
Um, the model suggests that it is going to be a little bit of a battle between these two teams. Um, we ended up deciding to move forward with uh, Houston on this one. And, and the reason for that was um, a couple things. Uh, experience, again, I mentioned this in the last game. They're coming in with four senior starters that made it last year. Uh, and then furthermore, this game is going to be played in Texas. So it's outside San Antonio. Um, so due to the fact that they've got a little bit more of an experienced team, Arizona's great, very consistent all year, but they've also a little bit of inexperience. And so for that reason, we are going with Houston to win this game and to go on a deep run within the tournament. Another toss up, basically 50, 50, but I mean, this is, this is one that we definitely wanted to point out because, you know, it, it is one seed. I mean, we're, we're predicting that the one seed can go down here and it's because Houston's a really strong team and put up, you know, decent odds. I mean, a lot of the one seeds that we see, uh, you know, I think about Gonzaga, they have like an 80% chance or higher basically against anyone. But when it came up against Arizona and, and playing Houston, who didn't have the higher, highest seed or only a five, but ends up only being 50-50. So it's interesting. Also, I think out of all the teams that we looked at as we were making the bracket, uh, this particular matchup, I think, was about the tightest. We saw two teams in absolutely every category from Jeff Sagrin all the way over to the uh, defensive efficiency. It was very, very tight. Absolutely. That one should be a fun game to watch, should it play out that way. Um, and then if you could take me to the east, take us to the east, uh, we're going to take a look at a couple potential matchups. So this one is going to be uh, a, a play-in game for St. Mary's. And what we're looking at is either IU or Wyoming. And so the, the, this is another one we wanted to call because there's a, a, a decent amount of externalities involved when you start looking at playing games, right, and start trying to pick uh, a team that's contingently not necessarily even in the, in the tournament yet, right? Um, so what we wanted to do is take a look at St. Mary's as a matchup, both versus Wyoming, as well as versus IU, which is Indiana University, um, to understand should one team win over the other, do either of those teams have a good chance against St. Mary's, right? Um, and so we went bold with this one. Again, if I had a big red alarm of a behind me, I'd be ringing it. Because um, the model is showing that there's a lot of confidence for Indiana over both Wyoming as well as St. Mary's. Uh, I'm not sure if Adam has it up, but I believe that it was uh, in the 75% range just in terms of uh, some of the matchups. So yeah, 65% for Indiana versus St. Mary's. Um, and then Indiana is also favored versus Wyoming. So before Indiana is even into the dance, we are going to go ahead and say that they are our pick within that first round versus St. Mary's. And so again, ambitious, bold, what the model shows is that should they win that first game against Wyoming, they're going to have a very good chance to win the second game against St. Mary's as well. I would say this is probably our boldest pick and, and trusting the model type of pick with <laughs> Indiana. Yes, yes, definitely a, uh, a, a bold pick going against the model. Um, again, just some of the contextual conversations that we we're seeing within the, the data points just really drove us to IU as a, uh, as a team to pick here. Um, so I did want to definitely call that one out. And I will say that at least one 12 seed has won against a five seed in 31 of the 36 tournaments. And so for us, Team Tipco here making this bracket. That is uh, the 112 seed that we have success, being successful in the first round and moving on, right? So um, usually one, and that's who we're leaning towards. Uh, and then Murray State versus San Francisco, because this is, this is going to be a, a close game and really a good game to watch. Again, Murray State, all the basketball fans. Ja, who plays on the Memphis Grizzlies now, right? Um, took them pretty deep recently. So for this matchup, Murray State versus San Francisco, it was Murray State by uh, just a couple, couple percentage points here. Um, but we feel like there's more to it, right? So we agree it's going to be a close game. Um, 
The difference is that on the Murray State side, they've got two absolute studs uh, with March Madness experience, KJ Williams and Tevin Brown. Uh, familiar with March Madness, been there, done that, seen it. And so that might be the difference. Murray State could potentially have a little bit of a home court advantage. Um, but really the, the biggest detriment for San Francisco was going to be that they're weak with free throws. They play some very solid defense against the three. But the biggest deciding factor for us was this. Murray State has won 20 games in a row. And the model suggests that this will be 21. So we do like Murray State in what could be a close game. But we're going to roll with the hot team here, the more experienced team. And we're going to pick Murray State. Um, so then if you could take a look at Texas and Virginia Tech. So for this one, a 11 versus a six. And the 11 is a favorite for the game, right? And so a couple of reasons why we think this is another upset alert, the imaginary red alarm going off behind me, please imagine it. <laughs> so Texas Tech, Virginia Tech, Virginia Tech's coming in as a favorite and they are Coming into the tournament, really, I mean, they just shocked Duke. They've been playing much better basketball the last couple of weeks, uh, really getting hot at the right time. Their big issue was always, you know, Virginia Tech can't beat the good team. We're, we're starting to see that's not the case. Um, Texas is a top team when it comes to adjusted defensive efficiency. They've got a great coach and Shaka Smart. So they play defense. They're well coached. They don't turn the ball over. Um but again, the knock against VT was that they can beat uh, top teams, but then they just won the ACC tournament. Uh, and then, you know, Texas has that same issue. They're three and eight against top 25 teams. So it's kind of hard to have that be a knock against Virginia Tech when Texas themselves aren't really winning the games against the top competition. So for this one, we do like an upset. We like Virginia Tech. The model agrees with us. And so this one's uh, another bold move in the first round for us. Yeah, there's a, another cool tidbit. I believe since 1985, number 11 seeds have beaten number sixes 54 times, which is about 37.5% of the matchups, which is extremely fascinating. And then I think it is one of the highest for a lower seed uh, to beat that seed. And this is, again, as you can think, across the years, across seeds, right? Not by individual teams, but just the six versus 11, there's something about it you know, where the C 11 C have a, a much higher success rate compared to some of the other upsets that we would expect. Um, so one more game in the East, if you could take us to Baylor, or actually we're gonna, we got Baylor UCLA. And so we, we, we foresee this as a close game in the Sweet 16. So both of these teams, very experienced, both of these teams have deep roster. UCLA is known for playing a little bit longer, kind of a taller roster, might be problems for Baylor, but the, the model does see Baylor pulling this one out. They've got four different players averaging in double figures, they have a very balanced attack, and then on top of it, the reason the model likes them is efficient defense. Um, one thing that we did not take into account, um, you know, we did, but just not on the surface, was that Baylor's also the returning champion, right? Uh, and so there is something to be said for that as well. Um, but for this one, this one was a little bit of a closer matchup, but we do like Baylor. Um, oh, by the way, the, I think the this game might be played a little bit closer for Baylor as well. Should it, I think it was it was not Philadelphia, right? So, oh, yeah, it was in Philly. So, so it'd, both be, it'd be a flight for, for both, definitely. But... Um, you know, it's a lot of star power. I mean, UCLA was the team that made the, the big run last year. I mean, they went from a playing team to making that magical run, and they're bringing back both both their stars. So, um, it, yeah, it's it's notable. I think that we we think that Baylor is a stronger team, but something to note for just everything here is that we're dealing with probabilities, right? So, um, you know, if Baylor is at fifty nine percent. It doesn't necessarily mean that if it's just over fifty percent that it should automatically tip us uh, to to pick that that team. Um, in this case, we did, but let's say that we've made you know a twenty 
at least 80% chance win probability. Uh, we maybe said that they would win for 20 of those matchups. Uh, you know, statistically, we would expect that, you know, four of those might go in the opposite direction. So we're working with the model and what's uh, kind of probabilistically um, what is going to happen, maybe some of our own uh, narratives and what we might have thought in the situation. But uh, since it's March Madness, like you have to expect unexpected. Um, oftentimes there are underdogs that could uh, basically shake up our whole bracket. But, um, you know, relying on our data and our modeling, we feel that we have, you know, advantage as uh, opposed to just random selection. Um, but you never know. So, you know, this is a case where one seed could go down. But for now, we're, we're sticking with Baylor just because, you know, they're just such a great team. So. Absolutely. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think they have a pretty good star power in terms of projected yep. to be a draft pick in Kendall Brown and uh, Jeremy Sochan. So I still think they have a better shot at this. Perfect. So what we'll do now is uh, I, I just want to take a look at a couple of the later games, uh, potential Elite Eight Final Four matchups that we have selected. And again, I, I think this might come up in the questions. Um, but if you could go to Tennessee, Houston. Tennessee, Houston. Yes. Yeah, so, so this is a later game, five seed versus a three seed. We see both of these teams moving on and being successful in the early rounds. Um, we see Tennessee bringing an end to Houston's run. Um, so there's two guards on Tennessee that can score in bunches, um, but really what we're seeing is that they're one of the best defensive teams in the tournament, specifically due to the rate that they're forcing turnovers. Um, so Houston's going to want to prefer that this is going to be a low scoring game. Uh, but overall, we feel like Tennessee is, you know, for a three seed, kind of the Cinderella story this year, um, but they're going to end Houston's run and also kind of start to tell their own story here this year. So we do like Tennessee, and Houston moving on to face each other, but we do like Tennessee taking that game. And then Gonzaga versus Duke, please. So coming out of the coming out of the West, we've got these two coming together later on, and really this is uh, what we foresee to be one of the one of the top matchups for the tournament, right? Um, the model might not see it that way. So, so the, the model is very heavily favoring Gonzaga in this matchup. Um, the one thing that you'll kind of see with Duke would be the, uh, the draft rating is the one thing that stands out, right? There's so much star power in that team. But everything else, Gonzaga is just more efficient with their offense, their defense, uh, as well as the way that they've been playing as of late. And so the model is very heavily selecting Gonzaga for this one. So Duke squeezes pack past Michigan State, runs into Gonzaga, and it is all over for Coach K. Or maybe John Cher can take him on a run next year. But we do like Gonzaga in this game. Uh, Purdue Baylor, please. Purdue Baylor. And uh, we do have a, a public link to this dashboard working that we can um, send to the audience. I'll send it at the end of the session so that – you can go ahead and do your own matchups here as well. So for the East, um, we have Purdue and Baylor coming up against each other. Um, Purdue, another team, a three seed that we've foresee going on a little bit of a run. Uh, one of the best offensive teams in the country. Uh, and we think it's going to be the difference in this game against Baylor. We, we think it might be a little too much firepower for Baylor to, to keep up with. Don't get it wrong. They've got four guys in double figures. But overall, we do like Purdue. Um, what, you, what we said with the last pick was that Baylor was the champion, returning champion, and so they kind of got that respect. At the same time, it's incredibly hard to repeat. And so um, for all those reasons, uh, we like them. But for many more reasons, the, the, the model actually likes them as well. And so we got a little bit of an upset there, but Purdue over Baylor. And then last but not least, Kansas versus Wisconsin. Uh, this is another game that should it play out this way is going to be a great game. Um, offensive efficiency 
we feel like will drive Kansas past Wisconsin in what should be a close game. Wisconsin's efficient on both sides of the ball. Let's, let's get that straight. But overall, the star power and coaching success on the Kansas side will be the difference in this one. So we have Kansas getting past Wisconsin, setting up a final four of Tennessee versus Kansas on one side of the bracket, Gonzaga versus Purdue on the other side of the bracket. Uh, we've got Tennessee and Gonzaga winning those games and taking us to the championship. So, um, Adam, if you could pull up Gonzaga and Tennessee, um, I do want to make sure that we are calling it out. So, and, and really quick, in the final four, Tennessee versus Kansas, we gave the nod to Tennessee because of their the continued defensive excellence. Since 07, number one seeds are 13-3 and three against number three seeds. But we feel like Kansas is going to be forced into some turnovers, um, which has been a, a detriment for them in the past, leading us to, again, Tennessee and Gonzaga in the finals. So for the Tennessee-Gonzaga matchup in the national championship game, tell you what, Gonzaga is a favorite of the model um, for every, everyone except for that first round, which is why we wanted to call it out. Georgia State's got something up their sleeves, apparently. Um, but uh, the model does like Gonzaga to be Tennessee in the championship. Tennessee's luck runs out as Gonzaga's just got too much firepower uh, for that for that very stingy defense of Tennessee. Um, we think that Tennessee's lack of depth will begin to show as they take on the second number one seed in a row, right? That's a, that's a tall task for any team. Um, and we actually have Gonzaga winning this game 64 to 59, proving that going back to a couple of points from earlier that the number one seed does usually dominate the number three seed. But, so that is where we are at. Overall, in terms of some of our main picks, some of the games that we just wanted to call attention to, some upsets, as well as where we see the bracket progressing just overall in terms of some of the top teams that are going to be successful this March. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. And so I will open it up to the group, both on the TIPCO side, as well as collectively for the participants and see if there's any questions, any, uh, anything specifically that you would like us to speak to. We, we did get a question about um, whether or not these models had to be developed by TIBCO or if uh, you could develop your own. And the, the answer is you can develop your own models um, within, uh, you can do it within Spotfire itself or you can do it within TIBCO Data Science. And then that works as a kind of uh, integration with uh, the Spotfire uh, interface. If, if you do it in Spotfire, you can do it in Python or R. If you do a typical data science, you have that drag and drop workflow, and that integrates with this uh, interactive analysis. And uh, again, I'm going to get that interactive analysis link. If you give me just a couple minutes, I'll get that link available. And so you can try your own matchups here. And then, um, Scott, I don't know if you wanted to talk through a little bit on the our final bracket and uh, just how we ended up. I know. Uh, uh, Bruce went through some of the more interesting games there, but while I get this link up, maybe you could talk about uh, some of the closer percentages. Yeah, absolutely. I know one of the, the questions that we had was, you know, do we have Kentucky uh, losing to Purdue, which we do. We've got uh, Purdue with a 74% uh, probability there of winning. Of course, when you're looking at probabilities and you're looking at something like that, 74% sounds relatively uh, certain, but really when you think about that, that's three out of four chance. If you were to give someone a, a one in four chance and that were to happen, uh, certainly that would not be considered uh, an extraordinary long shot to, to happen. So just keep that in mind as you kind of look at some of these numbers. Uh, but certainly as you look at kind of the first round, obviously we're seeing a lot of those uh, number one seeds uh, cruising through the first round. Some of the tighter things that we're looking at, LSU, versus Iowa that we highlighted, uh, Providence uh, versus South Dakota, Providence with just a 64% probability. Uh, Michigan, obviously, as we go up to the South with that 59% chance of, of moving past Colorado State. Uh, what else is really kind of close over here? Uh, a, a lot of closer matchups really in the West, and that even starts with Gonzaga there, as we pointed out with the, the lowest probability, uh, still very high at 87%. Uh, but a lot of matchups here in the 70s and 60s. So Memphis over Boise State at 79. Arkansas uh, cruising past Vermont, but again, 71% uh, probability there. And looking at that 73% winning uh, uh, probability there for Michigan State over Davidson. Uh, but you can see, you know, 
as you look through, uh, for example, specifically Purdue, uh, you can see how, how much the model likes them really through all four of the first four rounds there, uh, getting slightly less certain as we move through, but, but starting out at 89 and ending up at 71. Uh, certainly uh, bodes well for, for their chances as they move through the tournament. Um, Adam, anything you want to call out here as well? Yeah, well, one thing that came to mind is that uh, in the South too, um, maybe Ohio State and Loyola is one that's, uh, you know, a little bit uh, tighter. You know, Loyola has in recent years had that magic where they were able to make it through, although they have lost uh, some of the players that we uh, remember from them. But, uh, you know, as long as I have Sister Jean, you know, <laughs> you never know what type of uh, power they have. Just as a team here, where, where do we feel like we've really uh, put ourselves on the line? I think obviously when we look at that uh, uh, Indiana play-in game and having them over St. Mary's, I think that's one place where we've really kind of put our cards on the table. Um, Probably Barrel. Houston as well, right? I With the, maybe the five seed making a bit of a run, especially given the fact that Houston, Tennessee is, is something that's maybe not as certain as well, right? Um, so we think they're a strong team. I think Tennessee in the finals as well, I think is a relatively, yep. that's a relatively strong uh, choice on our part as well. But again, that's, that's, very much backed by the model here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've just uh, sent out the link on the chat to the matchup generator. Um, and uh, if uh, you can hand me over the screen real quick, I'm just going to do a quick, uh, and quick little tutorial on how to use it. Perfect. So let me share this. So that you'll see this working in your web browser. Um, all you need to do is hold down your control key and select your teams. You want to select two teams at a time. So if you have a team already selected, you can hold control and unselect it. And while you still have control selected, you can then select another team. So you multi-select with that control button. Um, any two teams that you pick, it'll run, it'll automatically run this uh, matchup calculation um, and give you the uh, percentage here. Uh, and then uh, it'll uh, run a separate API call to do the, the distance location. Now, we didn't do the, the game locations for every one of these uh, matchups, but you're, you, know, you should feel free to do that if you want to consider that as part of your uh, decision making. Um, you can choose those from the drop down here. Um, and then on the seed importance, I'll just uh, point out that, or the animated trends just point out that you do have a play button. If you hover below that uh, origin of the axis, you have a play button where you can hit play and, and then change these different metrics and see things that way. <laughs> 